So I started looking at other much more safer propulsion methods such as liquid bipropellant, uh, solid fuels, hybrids and things like that. And uh, over, over many years built lots and lots of engines ranging uh, from 10 newtons thrust to up to 6,500 horsepower was the, was the largest one before the, the Artea program, before the suborbital program. And um, essentially it was, it was really a, a trip to the United States that, uh, that, that spurred on the, the, whole, the whole Rocket Lab program. And um, I know I'm short on time but to uh, cut, cut a long story short, um, I, been collaborating with a whole lot of people in the United States over many years and um, when my wife went to go to the United States to, to go for work I went over with her and went on a bit of a rocket pilgrimage really and went and visited all these people that I've been corresponding with and, and all these companies that, I've, that I'd aspired to, to, to work for or um, be associated with such as Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing Rocketdyne and all those companies and I just rocked on up naive as anything and uh, to the reception introduced myself and uh, see how far I could get. And 90% of the time I got nowhere, but occasionally I hit pay dirt. Um, NASA JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratories at NASA, um, I got a tour around there. But uh, when I really hit pay dirt was when I met a guy called Carlos. And Carlos is a very interesting individual. He holds a, a warehouse full of, of uh, rocket engines, rockets, uh, valves and everything. And it serves as a bit of a, a museum almost for um, all the engineers at uh, NASA and Rocketdyne, Kistler, all those people they come in and they pick up these old valves from the Apollo era and look at how they work and, and, uh, and, and build on some of the knowledge that was already, already there from there. So anyway, Carlos, uh, introduced myself to Carlos and um, he says, yep, this is great. Here's my warehouse. Take as many photos as you want. Climb it all over these engines as you want. You can just spend the whole day there. So that's what I did. I spent the whole day there in Carlos's warehouse going through all these engines and all these bits of space equipment. And as I was going through it and crawling around these engines, I was starting to look at them and, and they're using the same pressure transducers as me, they're using the same strain gauges as me. Climb inside the, some of the engines and they're using the same injector pattern as me, same materials as me as, as far as I could tell. So at that point it started to, the, the goal of sending something to space, which evidently was always the original goal, um, started, to, uh, started to think maybe it's not such a ridiculous thing after all. And uh, Carlos suggested that, uh, that I go out to the Mojave Desert and talk to the guys out at Spaceship One. So those are the guys from Virgin Galactic uh, who sent the first um, private manned uh, suborbital vehicle into space. And through uh, Carlos's connections he, uh, he enabled um, me to go and visit those guys. So uh, that's what I did, jumped in my rental car and started booting out into the Mojave Desert. And I got uh, sort of halfway out in the middle of the Mojave Desert and I saw a sign that said Edwards Air Force Base. And that was extremely exciting for me because Edwards Air Force Base, this is where it's all happened, there's a NASA facility there, this is just amazing. So turned off, started off down to the Edwards Air Force Base, all very excited, until I arrived at a bit of a, a checkpoint and I noticed out of the corner of my eye a sign with the crest Edwards Air Force Base and a few bits of rocket and stuff stuck there. So I quickly pulled over, got out of my car and started taking photos of these, this, this crest and this rocket and all extremely excited. And there's nothing more uh, sobering to, to temper someone's excitement than a, than a dissatisfied man all dressed in green with an M16 over their shoulder. And he, uh, he started to ask some very awkward questions. And at that point I realised that perhaps this wasn't the best thing to be, to be, to be there at the time, especially in the fact that uh, I had a boot full of uh, rocket equipment, in fact an LR101 rocket engine that I got from Carlos, a whole lot of um, books and paraphernalia, and uh, a passport that had uh, a whole lot of Arabic in it from a, a trip to Egypt, Egypt a year earlier. So at that point in time, I really thought I might be spending some time in a jail here. But uh, never underestimate the, uh, the power of a New Zealand accent. <laughs> and uh, he started to ask me where I was from and Lord of the Rings and all the rest of it. <laughs> but uh, in the end, in the end uh, he, was, he was happy to send me on my way, but uh, did suggest that perhaps I didn't return. But I will be back, but I'll be back as Rocket Lab and I'll be selling them something. So uh, as, I, as I headed back out to the Mojave Desert, I managed to, uh, to talk to the lead propulsion engineer of, uh, of Scale Composites, so that's Virgin Galactic, Spaceship One, and I'm speaking to him, and they do a lot of, their, their main propulsion system was a hybrid, and at that time I was you know, doing a lot of research and work onto the hybrids, and speaking to him and sitting down with him, and he had the same problems with me, as me. He had the same problems with injector chuffing. He had the same problems with, with nozzle erosion. So things at that point also started to catalyse and maybe that I wasn't that far away from being able to do what I wanted to do. So uh, it was really on the, 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 the 
plane flight back really that um, that I decided it's time to time to time to form Rocket Lab Titan, time to really do this. And uh, that's great. So I arrived back in, in New Zealand, gonna do Rocket Lab, but convincing yourself that you have the ability to do it is one thing. The second thing is you need money, you need a business case to do this sort of thing. And it was through my, my background at uh, industrial research and working with some of the scientists and engineers there and in the New Zealand community, that it became apparent that um, the whole sounding rocket or the uh, suborbital rocket um, uh, community in the southern hemisphere was non-existent. If you're, a, if you're a southern hemisphere scientist or a northern hemisphere scientist for that matter and you want to conduct southern hemisphere uh, up atmospheric or solar physics research, you're stuffed. You can't. So essentially uh, Rocket Lab is uh, entire market is, is the southern hemisphere and it's all new markets, it's all new customers. In addition to that there's also the, the northern hemisphere and we receive a lot of inquiries from those guys as well. So armed with a, a business case um, uh, a misguided ability, and um, all we need now is, is an investor, someone with some money. Now, if you go to any New Zealand venture capitalist and say, hi, I'm Peter Beck, I want to send a rocket into space, you don't get a very good reception, even with a good business plan. So uh, it really took uh, a special person to, to throw some money to get the, the program uh, running initially, and that's a guy by the name of Mark Rocket. Now, Mark, that's not Mark's real name. He actually renamed himself Mark Rocket because he's so passionate about space. And he, uh, he bought the first ticket, first New Zealander to buy a ticket on the Virgin Galactic um, trip, in, trip into space. So Mark, uh, Mark put his money where his mouth is and, and threw a bit of money into the, into the company. And I essentially sold a bit of the company to him. And, uh, and that's, that, that started the whole Artea program and, uh, and started the whole research and, and development. Um, a little bit of about the status, the status of where we're at at the moment. So. Um, as far as the whole technical development of the RTA vehicle goes, we're essentially two-thirds done. Um, we're moving into ground-based, we've got some, some ground-based testing done, uh, such as propulsion systems, and uh, flight testing at the moment. So we're, we're hoping for a launch uh, early to mid-next year, all going well. Um, one of the, the biggest technical issues for us, excuse me, at, at the beginning of the program, it didn't look too bad. We could source, uh, source a lot of materials and, and a lot of technologies out of the United States. But that, in fact, is not true. The United States have a nasty little thing called ITAR, which is uh, Arms and Terrorist Trade Restriction Export Controls. And uh, for, for a, a United States company to send anything out to us in New Zealand, it's incredibly difficult for them. It takes about six months to one year to get a sample out of the United States, and it costs them about $20,000 to do on average. So what that essentially means is they need to sell us at least $20,000 worth of stuff to make it worth their while. Now, we'll just take one example, which is uh, a coating on the nose cone of the vehicle. Um, the nose cone of the vehicle sees about uh, 800 degrees C due to, atmospheric heat, um, atmos due to aerodynamic heating on the way up. Everybody else in the world, well, if you live in the United States, picks up the phone and says, I'll have some thermal ablative coating, please. Cost you a fortune, but you can get it. We could pick up the phone, can we have some thermal ablative coating, please? No way, not unless you buy a container full. That's no good for us. So. Essentially that put our whole development program, things like that put our whole development program well behind because we have to develop all those, um, those technologies and those materials in-house and that's exactly what we did with the, with the thermal ablative coating. As we looked at all the, the, the scientific papers and the, the prior art about it and we also digged up, dug up everybody's patent to make sure they weren't infringing on anybody, understood the physics and the science of what's going on behind it and uh, developed our own. And the ironic thing is now that we're, we're fielding inquiries from the United States to buy a thermal ablative coating. coating. In fact, <laughs> we've even got an inquiry from the Kennedy Space Center to line one of the uh, troughs, the launch troughs, uh, on part of their launch pad infrastructure. So it really backfired for old George on that one, but <laughs> it, uh, it, does, it does give us that little bit more IP and, and capability. The biggest, the biggest challenge for Rocket Lab is funding, keeping the beast fed. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a constant struggle for us um, dealing with, with New Zealanders and, and New Zealand government. New Zealand government's been pretty supportive, but um, especially the general public of New Zealand, venture capitalists and the like, anybody who wants to, to potentially um, have an involvement in the program is getting across that, herbal, that, that hurdle that New Zealand can actually participate in space. It doesn't cost billions of dollars to participate in space. And uh, everywhere in space, this is just, like we said before, fundamental global infrastructure. And it's not a fringe activity. <coughs> And that's the real challenge for us, is, is changing people's perception that, um, that space is something that New Zealand can actually participate in, and, and participate in very well. 